By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And before you think, hey, there's something wrong with this video, I don't see the players move, don't worry, this is just a screenshot, this is a still, because I just want to introduce the game to you and these players started playing so fast i really don't have time to make any introduction so i decided to just make this still and discuss the tournament a little bit with you and what you what you are about to see so this is a match played at the raging dwarf tournament this is an alpha beta magic the gathering tournament only and here we are going to see a richard the player on the left at least left for us right for richard and he's playing with his mono blue fish deck. So this is a completely alpha beta deck. And his opponent, Edo, is playing with UW Skies. Now, before we are going to the action, I'm first going to do a deck tech on both of these decks. I've got beautiful deck photos. So it's really, it's just beautiful to look at these decks. So stick around. But if you want to skip it, if you want to go straight to the action, I know some of you do, check the description below. There you will find a timestamp marked MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the action. As for here, I'm going to start with the deck deck of Richard Mono Blue Fish. And here we see the Mono Blue deck by Richard. And the first thing I actually noticed when I was looking at this deck, it was the land count. Uh, this may sound weird to you, but I'm looking at this deck and I'm thinking 24 lands, isn't that a bit much? You know, I mean, the, the deck is pretty low on curve. It's mono colored. So why would you need that many lands? And actually I, I asked Richard and he gave a very good explanation. He said, you know, I just need to make sure I get to four islands. I need to get to four islands. That's when the deck really works. And he did some calculating. He says, I need like four lands in a row every single turn. Consistency is key with this deck. And I kind of like this explanation. He's um, also uh, an ex poker player. So he's really good with numbers. So I'm, I'm going with it. And I myself run a Goblin deck Mono Red that's pretty low on mana because it's low curve. And I have to admit, it doesn't always work out great. So maybe I need to pop in a land or two. I guess for that deck, three would be kind of the, the sweet spot when, when it comes to lands. Anyway, that's a whole different deck. Let's, uh, let's zoom into this deck again. We see some classical combinations. Of course, your beautiful one drop Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Hopefully for Richard, it will be followed up by another two drop Lord of Atlantis. If not, then maybe he has a counter spell in hand to counter some threats of his opponent, or if need be, defend his own Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Not really sure why you would if your opponent is gonna spend some removal on that, but who knows, you never know what a game's gonna bring. Another one drop in this deck, of course, is the Black Vice. The Black Vice is great when you're on play. I'm expecting him to be boarding it out when he's on the draw, but we'll just we'll just have to see what his strategy is. And then there's the Control Magic, a full play set of Control Magics. Very strong because it's basically a two for one, right? You gain a creature, your opponent loses a creature. What I really like with playing Control Magic is if you can play the Control Magic and keep a counter spell open to counter the possible disenchant, especially against UW Skies, you know he's playing disenchants, so you probably wanna have that counter spell open. That being said, that does mean that you have six mana and this deck wants to operate very quickly. It's an aggressive blue deck, right? So maybe you're like, worst case scenario, I take the creature for a turn, opening up the board and attacking him with my lords and my merfolks and my clones, whatever I have on the board. Of course, those beautiful juggernauts deal five damage every time. And actually in alpha beta, the juggernaut ability, the five, three, four, four to cast, uh, that says cannot be blocked by walls. In alpha beta, that can actually be relevant because players do play walls in this format. Um, another card here, of course, are the four psionic blasts. That just It's such a strong card. It just doesn't seem fair to give blue direct damage, but you know what? In old school, blue had direct damage in the form of psionic blast. There are also a few other cards that can deal some direct damage. Of course, Timmy being one of them, uh, but this is a spell that can deal direct damage. And psionic blast deals four damage, one blue and two to cast for an instant. It also deals two damage to you, but you know what? Who cares? It deals four damage. It takes out a Sarah Angel. How sweet is that? So this is the deck of Richard. I'm really curious how that mana curve is gonna work out if he doesn't flood himself, but maybe maybe he won't. And I'm just really curious to see how it's gonna work out. So this is the deck of Richard. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Edo, UW Skies. And here we see UW Skies by Edo. And 
Yeah, this looks like a very strong deck. I guess it's a little bit different in your usual UW skies because of course you're kind of limited to that alpha beta card pool. I'm saying limited, I kind of like the limits because there's so many beautiful cards and a few cards that really pop out here for me. There are some usual suspects like the blue power, of course, the Sarah Angels, uh, the counter spells, there's nothing really exciting about that. Well, they're beautiful cards, of course, but it's nothing special. Uh, but what I really like to see in this deck are the two Semite healers. That is just great. And I think, again, it's going to be relevant in the Alpha Beta environment because there's much more combat in Alpha Beta. That's one of the things that I like about this format. Combat, to me, is one of the most interesting phases in the game of Magic. And unfortunately, unfortunately what you see in the old school scene is that creatures are just not as good as the spells. So... For a lot of top decks, the amount of creatures is becoming less and less and the amount of spells is becoming more and more, you know, especially with those five color good stuff decks. And what I really like is just the basics of magic where you have the combat happening. Combat is so interesting and there's so many cool synergies and cards that do something combat related. One of those is Semite Healer. And I think, you know, with this Semite Healer, you can now uh, destroy a Sengir Vampire with your Sarah Angel, right? If you've got two Semite Healers, you can actually save your Sarah Angel from a Juggernaut. You know, that's a pretty big deal. Another thing that I really like in this deck um, is that little uh, combination here with Siren Skull and Icy Manipulator. So Siren Skull is a blue card. It's an instant. It's, it's really an interesting card. It forces your opponent to attack with all his creatures. And if they can't attack, they are destroyed, right? So what you can do with Icy Manipulator is you can tap down some of the uh, the creatures of your opponent, then you can play Siren Skull. The creature is unable to attack because it's tapped and then it actually gets destroyed. So this is a removal tool by Edo. And I think it's really cool. And it's uh, I'm looking forward to see that in action. Hopefully we're going to see that in action. Another card I really like here is Steel Artifact. There are a lot of strong artifacts in this format. I think he's going to see a lot of Jam Day Tomes that he can steal with the Steel Artifact. It's not going to be as useful against this specific deck, but I think overall in the tournament and the Alpha Beta environment, Steel Artifact is a very strong card. Then when I'm looking at the sideboard, I'm seeing, of course, the Circle of Protection is blue. Who still plays that? Well, Edo does, and he's got two in the sideboard, so that promises something for game number two and game number three, and also that beautiful reverse damage. I think reverse damage is great against red decks, you know. He's going to play a huge fireball on you. You play a reverse damage and usually then it's game over for the red player because they play very aggro. Of course, he's now not facing a red deck. He's facing a blue deck. So I don't expect him to board it in for this specific matchup. But I just wanted to mention it because I think it's just such a beautiful card. You don't see it often. And you know what? Maybe I'm going to play it in a couple of decks after seeing it here. I just... It's really nice art. Um, so this is the deck of Edo. In my opinion, I feel that Edo is a favorite here um, because he's playing with two colors that gives him some more flexibility. He also seems to be having some more power in his cards, literally because he's playing with power cards. Uh, but you know, when you're playing against an aggro deck like Richards, you can lose, it can happen. These games can go so quick that before you know it, you've lost two games. That can definitely happen. So I'm. I, it, it's not 50-50 for me. For me, Edo is the slight favorite. Let's say 60-40. Let's go to the games and then find out. Let's go to game one. Game number one. And Richard on the left, Edo on the right. There we see Richard on the play here with a basic island. Passing turn to Edo. And then sweet play mid by Edo, by the way. Deacon Blackblade. The legendary creature. We're not going to see him in this Alpha Beta tournament. And of course, there's the King of the Hill playmate of Richard because he won the Hill Giant Cup last year in Hilversim. So he is still King of the Hill. There is a Swords to Plowseers on that Lord of Atlantis. And that means two more lives for Richard here. And passing turn. And if I think it's a good decision from Edo to playing it in his own main phase because you're playing against the blue mage. You don't want to give him the option to counter your swords to plowshares. And I think you got to be aggressive with like getting rid of the threats because Richard has his quick aggro blue deck, right? And for Edo, it's better to drag that game into mid game. So, so far, Edo is doing a good job. It's already turn four here for Richard. Remember, he said that four mana is key for his deck. 
but we don't see anything at four mana. Okay, so I was actually expecting a juggernaut or, you know, just a creature in general, but I guess he just hasn't found them in his hand yet. There is a Chaos Orb here. Will there be a Counterspell? No Counterspell from Richard. Just drawing another card, mana number five. Hopefully for him, he can find a Brain Geyser somewhere in this game to utilize all those lands. And there we see Edo untapping here. Four lands for him as well. Two blue, two planes. Actually, he missed the land drop. Interesting. I missed that, that he missed the land drop. I guess that happened last turn when he played the Chaos Orb. So a little tight on lands here. I think for Edo's deck, you also want to have enough lands on the table. Will we see, oh, an Icy Manipulator? I want to say, will we see a Jam Day Tome? No, we see an Icy. Makes sense because he's playing with three Icy Manipulators. And, I mean, things are looking pretty bad for Richard, actually. Gonna tap two. Will we see another Lord of Atlantis here? No, there's a copy artifact. Interesting. Is he gonna copy the Chaos Orb or is he gonna copy the Icy Manipulator? You probably have the same effect. If you copy the Icy, the chances are that... Um, ooh, let's see what he's gonna do. Tapping another two. Another copy. Oh, oh, oh another copy artifact. Oh, man. And I guess he turned it into a Chaos Orb. So he's gonna flip... Probably on the Chaos Orb. Look, um, Edo is completely tapped out here, so he's kind of giving Richard this opportunity and uh, hitting the Chaos Orb here. Chaos Orb number one is gone, and he's now going to use Chaos Orb number two, I guess. He knows that Edo is playing with white, so he knows he's got artifacts. So now he's going to flip on the Icy Manipulator, taking a moment, standing up here, taking this very, very seriously. Good job, Richard, taking it like a pro, taking out both artifacts here. And... In a way, you can say, what a great play from Richard. In another way, you can look and think is when you're Edo, think, okay, I just traded two artifacts for two copy artifacts of my opponent. It's not that bad. You know, it could be worse. And there's a new IC manipulator being played by Edo, who's still stuck on lands, by the way. Look at his land count. It's still stuck on four. And if we didn't look at Richard, he's got seven. Ooh, double vice. I wonder how many cards he has in hand. We'll see it now. He's going to 18. That means that he's got five cards in hand. So he took two damage. Now he's going to draw card number six. Can Edo find some lands or at least find other cards that he can play out? And no, he cannot. He's just passing turn here. Remember, he's got six in hand. That means four damage next turn. Is Richard actually going to win this one? Well, he's not there, of course, but I'm a little bit surprised. Are we going to see a Mahamoti Jin here for six? Oh! <laughs> Oh, oh, Mahamoti joining the party. Oh, no, counterspell. Oh, man. I understand, Edo. I know it, man. But And also a disenchant on the Black Vice. In a way, it's interesting, this choice to counter the Mahamoti Jin. The reason that I'm saying this is that Edo also had an IC in play. So he has means to an end. He can work out the, um, can handle the Mahamoti. On the other hand, now it makes more sense. He's got that Sarah. He wants to get rid of that 5-6 blocker, play the Sarah next turn, start dealing some damage. We saw now no counter spell by Richard, of course, because he had to tap out almost completely to cast that Mahamoti Jin. And is there, oh, control magic. And remember, Edo just played that disenchant to get rid of a Black Vice. Maybe he's regretting that decision now because now he's staring down at his own Sarah Angel. And remember, look look at the mana of Richard. He can protect it with a counterspell. That's something I talked about. Disenchant, is he going? No, no counterspell. And also looking at his hand size, only one card in hand for Richard. So it was very unlikely that he would have a counterspell. And uh, this is good news for Edo. I think Edo is, ooh, Ancestral Recall. Yeah, this is kind of brutal. And this is kind of a game you saw Richard there. Oh, thank you. I'm going to draw three cards. Funny, these players know each other well. A lot of banter going on back and forth during this match. And, um, I mean, it's looking so good for, for Edo right now. I have to say, Edo, you played this, this really well. I, I kind of had my doubts on a few of your plays, but it's working out really well. And you can start attacking him. It's always difficult to judge somebody's plays. And I've said this before. It's really difficult to judge somebody's plays based on what you see. You don't see the hand, right? They don't, you don't know the deck as well as, of course, the player who's playing with the deck. There we see a clone cloning that Sarah Angel, by the way. So that's a 4-4 flyer now as well for Richard. And then casting a Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. So that Merfolk is not going to do much. 
But remember, when the D-Shark draws a Lord of Atlantis, it becomes a 2-2 unblockable because it gets Island Walk and Edo has beautiful islands over there. Let's see what's going to happen next. Another Sarah? Oh, Control Magic. And now he's got two Sarah Angels. Edo's like, I can do the Control Magic game. I think Control Magic, one of the stronger cards in the, uh, in the Alpha Beta card pool. And passing turn here. And it's not looking good for this shot. I mean, he's staring down at an Icy Manipulator and two Sarah Angels. I mean, he's on 18, but that's going to change very, very rapidly if he cannot do anything against the situation. There's a Chaos Orb. That can help a little. Remember, he can flip. Or will we see a Counterspell here from Edo? Edo's playing with two Counterspells. Already played out one, I believe, on the Mahamoti. And he's going to flip. So he's going to flip. We see a lot of flips. I like that. He's going to flip on the Control Magic here. At least I assume he's going to. Let's see. I thought he was stepping down to blue to flip. Now I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think he is. They're just discussing it right now. And he's going to stand up again. He's take, he's doing his part. Good job, Richard, taking this very seriously. And there is a flip. There's the hit. Oh, interesting. This is interesting. He's actually not... Getting back their control magic and getting back his own Sarah Angel instead. Wow, this is interesting. He's choosing to destroy the Sarah Angel of his opponent. I wonder why. I'm sure there's a reason behind this. Let me know in the comments below. Richard is a very good player, so I know he's got a reason for doing this. And let's see if Edo can put some more pressure on the board here. He's going to... Tap some more lands. Tapping four in total. Will we see a clone? Oh, he's tapping five. Another Sarah, perhaps? Brain Geyser. Casting a Brain Geyser for three. So after the Ancestral Recall, that means he's now drawn six cards. Of course, you've got to deduct the Brain Geyser Ancestral Recall. So he's kind of up four cards compared to his opponent, the Richard. And I mean, that should give him the victory, right? We see Richard, no cards in hand. He's on 14. And he's going to draw. And finding an island. And just passing turn here. And Edo, what can he find? Gonna attack first. Richard down to 10. And he's gonna tap some cards here. And there is another Sarah Angel. Wow, this is pretty brutal. Another Sarah Angel here. That means that Edo can now just swing in for eight next turn. That means that Richard has two turns. And at least it looks like he's taking some damage from the vice. Not quite sure. There's a top deck here from Richard. Nothing or at least nothing he wants to play out now. Remember, he does play with four Psionic Blasts, so he can blast away an Angel. But, of course, the downside when you're under pressure, it does take two life. I guess he doesn't have it. He's going to fall down to two. Does he have Counterspell? What's Edo going to do? Yeah, there is a Psionic Blast. Will we see a Counterspell? Yep, there is a Counterspell. This is just going to buy him one more turn. And um, it's it, it makes sense that Edo... Played it, your opponent only has one card in hand. If it's a counterspell, it's a counterspell. Then you trade a counterspell for a blast. It's not too bad. And here we see a juggernaut, and that's it. So game number one here is won by Edo. It looks like he wants to do something. Oh, he's going to play the Mustard Man. He's going to play Power Sink to make matters even worse. Yeah, Edo, I think you've won. Okay, go do it. Untap and attack. Do it. Yeah, untap and attack. Good job. Edo winning here at game number one. And um, yeah, I'm curious to see what these players are going to board in and um, if it will affect game two. Will we see that circle of protection blue? Okay, so this was game one. We'll give these players some time to sideboard and we'll catch back up to them in game number two. Game number two. And can Richard bounce back? Can he take the victory? He needs a quicker start than we saw. Hey, this is a quick start. Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Turn 1-1 one, one blue, 1-1 one, one Merfolk. And in the picture, you see a merman and a mermaid. And there is Lord, Lord of Atlantis. This is exactly what Richard wants to do. This is your typical fish deck move, right? 
So that means that Edo is going to drop to 18. Second island here, not finding white. Or maybe wanting to keep a counter spell open. That's probably the reason why he's doing this. Attacking here for four now. Edo is going to drop to 14. This can be a very quick game. There's a Chaos Orb hitting the board. Will we see a counter spell? No counter spell from Edo. And another island kind of slamming it on his play, man. I think he really wants white mana. Maybe he's got a, a Swords. Swords would stop the bleeding so much for Edo. That would mean like the, the Merfolk would become a 1-1 one -one again because the Lord is destroyed. But it's not happening for him. It's going to find another attack. Will we see a Psy Blast? That kind of does some work. The only downside of this is that Edo does take 2 damage from his own Psy Blast. So going to 12 and then going to, to 11 because of the hit from the Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. He's on 11, so his life total is almost cut in half here. And we're now in turn four. Still only islands here for Edo. And yeah, he's just passing turn here, looking a little frustrated. Another attack with the Merfolk. Edo dropping to 10. Look at the land count of Richard. Despite all his lands, he's actually running low on them, only finding three mana so far. And tapping for control magic on Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. Oh man, this is hilarious. Um, I I get the play and I don't get the play. Maybe I wouldn't do it. I'm not quite sure. Is he gonna play a control magic on on? Uh, oh no. Okay, that would have been funny if it would have played a control magic on the control magic of uh, Edo here just for the Merfolk. I guess next turn. Oh, okay, there we see a white man. I'm expecting a disenchant here, or maybe he wants to keep the dis open. To deal with the Chaos Orb activation. What he can do next turn, of course, is he can use his Merfolk of the Pearl Trident to block the Juggernaut. And in that case, the Control Magic, or are we going to see Disenchant here on the Juggernaut? Or maybe on the Chaos Orb, since Richard is tapped out. Oh, it looks like he's changing his mind. It is a difficult decision. I think what I would do, but I don't see what's in his hand, right? That's a huge difference. But I think what I would do is play, have played a disenchant on the Chaos Orb and just jump block the Juggernaut now. And I think we saw a disenchant there on the Juggernaut, I assume. Will we see a counter spell? There is a counter spell. So that means that if you're Edo, you probably want to jump with the Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. And then actually what Edo got back for the Control Magic was he killed one of the creatures of Richard and he gained six life, right? Because he didn't take the extra hit from the Merfolk, he didn't take the extra hit from the Juggernaut. So it's not actually not that bad of a decision. Let's look, what else is in his hand? Does he have maybe another Control Magic perhaps? At least forcing a Chaos Orb activation from Richard. Does he have Swords to Plows here? That could work. He just really needs to stop the Juggernaut. It looks like he's a little bit in the tank here, staring down at his cards. He's got four cards. Maybe he really wants to have double white for Sarah. He just doesn't have it. Um, actually, an Icy Manipulator would do wonders. And there we see a Swords to Plows here. So that's five life for Richard, but at least it kind of stops the bleeding. And Edo's still at 10. Game's still pretty much open. Three cards in hand. And uh, yeah. Interesting game so far. And tapping three here, and he's gonna cast, oh, I like this. Gonna cast a Time Twister. Oh, this is really sweet. Will we see a counter spell from Richard? No, oh, he's showing Psionic Blast. I thought he was playing it out. He doesn't have the mana to do that, unfortunately for Richard. He's saying, oh man, I could have dealt three damage for free here. Unfortunately, or four damage, of course, because it's a Psionic Blast. And that would have put Edo on six. He had a second Psionic Blast in hand. That would have put him on eight, uh, sorry, two. So he was almost dead with those two Psionic Blasts in Richard's hand alone. But I guess we are going just to draw a fresh seven. And I must say my favorite power card is the Time Twister. It's just such a fun card, such a beautiful card. And uh, I just really like it. It's just great to give both players a fresh hand, you know. And uh, so Edo now looking at his seven. Of course, the downside of this for Edo is he has to pass turn to Richard. And Richard can untap and he can just have a whole nice start of the game. I guess it's still Edo's turn, you know, so he can still do something. Playing his land for turn. He didn't do that yet. That is true. Playing a soaring here. Okay, now it gets interesting. Can he find something else? Tapping four, maybe an icy. And, ooh, that looks like a Steel Artifact. Oh, that would have been interesting. 
But there's a counter spell from Richard. Oh, that would have been interesting if that would have succeeded because then probably Richard would have activated it in response if he can counter it. And that's a great way to kind of force a flip from your opponent. And there we see double Merfolk of the Pearl Trident, but no Lord of Atlantis. And I think Edo just wants to play a blocker now, like a Sarah Angel, for example. Or maybe first an Icy kind of forcing the Chaos Orb activation. Maybe that's what he's hoping for. That would be a pretty good strategy, actually. Playing a Sarah Angel would simply mean it would be removed by the Chaos Orb, I guess. So if he has both, then I would have also chosen to first play the Icy. Attacking or well, wanting to attack, I'm expecting a tap down from the IC of one of the two Merfolks here. I mean, he's still on 10, he can take a damage. So it looks like, yeah, he's using the IC manipulator, tapping down one of the Merfolks. And what do we see here? He's tapping, or are we going to see? We see an activation. Now remember, the IC is already on the stack, the ability. So the Merfolk is going to be tapped no matter what. So we see the flip here. IC is going to be destroyed. And probably Edo is going to take a damage here. Going to go down to 9. Because Richard attacked with that second Merfolk of the Pearl Trident. And he's passing turn. Edo untapping. So this is looking pretty good for Edo. It's not too bad, you know. He only took a little bit of damage. It's actually on 8, I see. There is a jam day tome. It is, this is great news. If Richard cannot counter this, this could mean victory here for Edo. Tapping, tapping, tapping. Gonna draw a card. Interesting. Of course, still having two blue open for a counter spell. There is a psionic blast. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Does he have a second psionic blast in hand? Then it's game over. It's very dangerous here. This life total of Edo. He's in psionic blast range. Remember, Richard playing with four of those. Is he going to play the next one? No, he's going to attack first. Oh, look at that. He's going to go to two. There's one sword. So I guess he's going to go to three here. Oh, this game is so tight. If he has a Psionic Blast, it's over unless Edo has a counter spell. He's going to tap five. Will we see Air Elemental? Oh, it's beautiful. I love seeing Air Elemental. Such a beautiful creature. Always a pleasure to see an Air Elemental on a board anywhere in the world. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And there we see Edo taking another card. What can he still do? He's staring down at two creatures. First thing he needs to do is play a blocker or an Icy or something. Okay, there's a blocker in the form of Sarah Angel. There is a counter spell. So that means Sarah is a goner. And remember, he doesn't have enough white to play a second Sarah Angel if he would have one. Actually, a control magic would be fantastic right now for Edo. Taking their air elemental, that could really save him. And we see another Swords to Plows here. It's on the Air Element. Okay, that's also good news here for Edo. That means he buys himself some time. But remember, if Richard can find a Psionic Blast, it's game over already. Unless he has a Counterspell in hand, of course. But I don't think so, because he allowed the Air Elemental to be played as well. On the other hand, you can allow an Air Elemental when you've got a Swords. You know, you can use your Swords to deal with the Air Elemental. He is going to 2. There we see, no, not a side blast, but a copy artifact on the book, probably. He's going to draw some cards here. This is bad news for Edo. And this is interesting. This is something that you have to think about when you're playing with artifacts, if you're playing against some somebody with a copy artifact. It wouldn't have mattered much. I think just playing out the book for Edo made absolute sense, by the way. I'm not saying that was a wrong decision, but I'm just saying in general... It's interesting when you play against somebody with copy artifacts. You, got, you kind of got to change your strategy from time to time. There's a disenchant here on the Jam Day Tome. So that's good news. And another sword. So we kind of see Edo, he's taking control back in the game. The problem is for Edo, he is on two. That is his problem. What he needs to do is he needs to dig. Oh, what is he going to play? Brain Geyser. If Edo can survive this turn, but because remember, he is tapped out. So... I mean, if Richard has a Psionic Blast, he's dead, right? But if Edo can survive the upcoming turn and he can keep a counter spell 
in hand to take care of a Sayani Blast, he might come back from this. I mean, he's got a full grip of cards. The D-Shirt only has one card. The only problem for Edo here is that D-Shirts is on what? 29 after all those swords and Edo's on two. Oh, this is sweet here for D-Shirts. He's just tapping down completely. He's saying, I've got such a high life total. I don't care. I don't need my lands. I don't need to counter anything. I just need to find a Psyonic Blast. So he's tapping out. He's refilled his hand. So Brain Geyser after Brain Geyser. This is such a cool, such a cool game. What is Edo going to do? We're playing another island. Tapping five. Will we see Sarah? Sarah Angel on the board. The D-Shirt cannot counter. So that's Sarah on board. And he's untapping with all his might. Will we see a Psionic Blast? And then the next question is, does Edo have a counter spell? He's going through his hand. Lots of cards there. Does he have something useful? Control Magic would be nice now as well. Playing Lord of Atlantis. Remember, he's already lost three Merfolk of the Pearl Tridents. Playing another Lord, so they give each other Island Walk and plus one, plus one. So there are now two, three, three Island Walkers. But hey, we see the Mustard Man. There's a counter spell, Power Sink. And a Side Blast. Oh, well played, Trichard. Well played. <laughs> that is so interesting. So he's really trying to think, okay, I'm expecting Edo to have a counter spell, you know, Power Sink or the regular counter spell. So I'm going to do whatever I can to try to force him to play it out before I play my Psyonic Blast or before I play my Control Magic because he also had Control Magics in his hand. Wow, what a fantastic game. It is 1-1 and that means we are going to game number three. 1-1, game number three. Here we go, Edo on the play. This has been a really sweet matchup. I, I, have to, I think Edo is favorite here, but we'll, we'll have to see. There we go, starting with a Plains, basic Plains, passing turn. There's an Island, Black Vice. Okay, interesting to see that while he's on um, on the draw, but it does mean Edo's going to take some damage here. And remember, d has got a really quick deck. If he can just get damage out really, really quickly, I mean, Edo, could, Edo can definitely lose this. He's going to go to 18, finding another Plains. Whoa, oh, oh, no, insane! Circle of Protection Blue, really? And remember, Richard can't counter this. Oh, man. Okay, yeah, look at that. Nice middle finger from Richard. And uh, remember, these, these players are friends. This is all just friendly banter. Don't worry, it's not a fight or anything. It's uh, But of course, Richard's like, what am I going to do? Or the decisive game. And I think game three is over now, right? I mean... Does Richard have anything to take care of the COP Blue? All he can do really, okay, copy artifact, copying the Black Vice. And remember, Black Vice also copies the color. So it becomes an artifact in color as well. It's no longer considered blue. So that means that Edo does take damage here from the vices. But I mean, all Edo really needs to do is dump his hand. Okay, I see Edo missing a land drop. This is getting interesting. Remember, he's taking damage from two Black Vices if he can't find mana. And, you know, Richard also has Juggernauts, of course, that can deal some damage. And Edo has to have enough mana open for the COP Blue here. Taking damage, going to 12. Look at that. So he's really going down, taking six damage. Was that six damage? At least he's finding an island, but not playing out anything. He needs to empty his hand. That's what he needs to do. And he should just doing nothing here. He's saying, you know what? Pass turn. <laughs> I think if you're Richard, what you want to do here is just keep your counter magic open and just hope that Edo cannot find any lands. Look at his life count. He's already on eight. He took four damage. Remember, there are two black vices on the table. He's on eight. Is it Richard actually going to win this? That would be close to impossible, right? When I saw the COP blue, it was like, yeah, Edo has this in the bag. But look at Edo going to two. Finding land number four, he can finally play out something, but it's not going to be enough. He's got seven in hand here. He needs to dump his cards. Icy is not going to save you. And Psyonic Blast. Yeah, that's it. Oh, what a weird, weird, weird game number three. I mean, 
I guess this happens because it just happened, but I didn't see this coming. I really thought, Edo, when you dropped it, COP Blue, I thought, okay, this is over. But that is magic. It wasn't over, and uh, Richard was able to win it with a double black vice. I mean, <laughs> I mean you were stuck on lands. It happens. Uh, we're now staring down at the beautiful pile of cards of uh, Richard. So congratulations. And also I'd like to thank uh, Richard and Edo for bringing these decks to the table and sharing it with us right here on Timmy Talks. And I'd also like to thank you for watching another episode of the channel. Now, if you want to support the channel, it's very simple. I'm sure you do. Leave a like, leave a comment. And if you're not subscribed yet, please consider to subscribe. About 50% of my viewers is not subscribed. I'm sure you have your reasons, but it would be really helpful if you could click on that subscriber button. It really helps the channel to grow. And another thing you can do talking about that, you can become a patron. You can already support Timmy Talks with $1 a month and you can click on the info card that's appearing right now. And that means your channel will appear in the super cool end scroll with that theme music. Isn't that what everybody really wants in life? Talking about that, let's take a look at the end scroll with our beautiful channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Let's go. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee.